a great week uh, for online cardiac grand rounds. Um, I'm going to ask uh, Ed Miller to introduce our speaker for today. Thanks, Ed. Thanks, Oyuri, and welcome, everybody. Um, it's my pleasure to introduce Samit Pawar, who's our third year fellow, going to be graduating with us um, in uh, next month. Um, and Samit, uh, I've known Samit since uh, he was a, an intern res resident in, in Boston, um, and has, he had a commitment, a sustained commitment to innovation uh, and entrepreneurial spirit for years. And so I'm really excited to hear what he's going to be talking about during his efforts to engage with the innovation uh, uh, forces at work in the health system during this pandemic and what we can see for the future. So Samit, uh, wonderful to hear your talk and, 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 and good luck with Hello and uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, thanks, Ed, for the kind introduction. And uh, thanks for giving me the opportunity to speak. And thanks, everyone, for joining in. Uh, the title of my talk is Ingenuity and Innovation During the Pandemic, The Case for Telemedicine. Here are my dis disclosures. So here's the background for choosing this topic. The pandemic has shaken the foundations of my worldview. And as a result, I have more questions than ever about how the world works. I plan to list observations to stimulate new ideas for the collective good. This will be the outline of my talk. I will start with assessing the impact of the pandemic on the healthcare system, followed by studying the factors responsible for telemedicine growth during the pandemic, exploring uh, the kind of innovations that will be required to establish telemedicine in a post-pandemic world, and finally re reviewing how virtual care will change what it means to be a patient and a physician. Here is a transmission electron microscopy snapshot of SARS-CoV-2, which was unknown a few months ago. This virus has spread to all parts of the world and has taken a significant toll on human lives. The disruption of modern society has been unprecedented and has penetrated all walks of life in every part of the world. Global economic activity is projected to decline significantly as projected by the International Monetary Fund. Above all, the healthcare system has been hit the hardest by the pandemic. I will make an attempt at assessing the impact of the pandemic on the healthcare system. First, uh, the regions hit hardest by the pandemic have experienced increased healthcare spending over the coming months, somewhere between 34 billion and 500 billion in added private insurance spending and between 7 billion to 30 billion in added spending for Medicaid and Medicare programs. Second, there has been a sharp decline in elective services, severely affecting practices that focus on elective procedures. Here are some data from HCA Healthcare, which is the largest operator of for-profit hospitals in America. It shows a 70% drop in outpatient surgeries and a 30% drop in inpatient admissions. The loss of elective surgeries is putting tremendous financial strains on hospitals. YNHH is reported to lose $1.5 million per day. However, it is not just elective services that are affected from the pandemic. There's been a decline in STEMI activations. These are data collected from several cat labs across the country. The average STEMI activation seen per month was around 25 <clears throat> before the pandemic, and the number has dropped to an average of 15 during the pandemic. The cumulative numbers also show a significant decline as the pandemic has worsened. The number of STEMI activations seen in March is around 138, which is 33% lower than the, same, than the number in comparison with March 2019. There has also been a decline in ACS admissions. Uh, these are data from Europe, uh, collected from over 90% of cardiology centers from Austria in the month of March. If we look at the numbers from the last week of March, 
there were close to 150 admissions for ACS. This was 60% lower than the historic weekly average of 350 to 375. Here are some of the trends seen at YNHH. The blue line represents uh, the number of COVID-19 patients, which peaks around 450 towards the end of April. The red, green, and yellow lines represent the inpatient imaging and procedural lab volumes with cardiovascular medicine, which are significantly lower than the historic values. While hospitals are experiencing a marked reduction in volumes, there is another important trend that will have an immense impact on the healthcare system. This trend has been the rise of unemployment. These are data that compare the substantial difference in the incidence of unemployment during the pandemic with the last economic recession of 2008. While these numbers give a partial glimpse at uh, the effect of the pandemic. To get a better understanding, let's examine another effect of the pandemic, which has been um, a several fold increase in remote working. These are data showing the breakdown of remote working capability by income quartets. I want to point to two numbers in this graph. The first one is the average number of workers in the lowest income quartile that had the ability to work remotely. This number is close to 10%. On the other hand, of people in the highest income quartile, about 60% had the ability to work from home. <clears throat> uh, these numbers uh, of remote working during the pandemic reveal the full extent of the effects of unemployment by disproportionately affecting the lowest income categories. Over 40% of those in the bottom quintile stayed at home and are unable to work from home, <clears throat> compared to less than 20% in the highest income quintile. As a result of the disproportionate effects of the pandemic on low income populations, we will be seeing many people in the population losing out on employer dependent insurance coverage, which on average accounts for over half of the US population. And because of people losing out on health insurance, there will be a rise in the uninsured and people applying for Medicaid. We talked about how the pandemic is creating new disparities as a result of the unemployment. But let's take a look at how the pandemic is exacerbating existing disparities. Here is an example from the city of Chicago. Based on data in the beginning of April, 50% of COVID-19 cases were seen in the city's black population and accounted for 70% of mortality, even though only 30% of the city's population is black. Furthermore, the neighborhoods highlighted at the bottom of the map, which represents the south side of Chicago, accounted for a majority of COVID-19 cases. Similar trends have been reported in Louisiana, Michigan, New York, and other parts of the country. In summary, the pandemic will lead to increased surge-related spending in areas worse hit by the virus. Irrespective of geographic region, there has been a marked drop in both elective as well as emergency services. And rising unemployment is making major changes in the health insurance coverage by making low-income groups lose out on employer-dependent health insurance and is worsening existing disparities. This crude summary of the effects of the US healthcare system will obviously raise many additional questions, but it is central to the argument presented in my talk that innovation in healthcare is no longer optional. Amidst the human tragedy afflicted by the pandemic, stories of ingenuity that reflect the tenacity of the human spirit inspire us to grapple with the effects of the pandemic. Furthermore, with the resultant economic catastrophe, reinvigorating the healthcare system will be an important part of the journey towards economic recovery. To summarize my argument in words of Jedi Master Yoda, do or do not, there is no try.
The reason for choosing telemedicine to exemplify the role of innovation in the healthcare system is because telemedicine has proven to be one of the most important tools at our disposal in response to the pandemic. A host of changes in regulations and financial incentives have made the current environment extremely conducive to the expansion of telemedicine. The technology that enables telemedicine has existed for decades. Here are some of the highlights. The internet came into existence in 1990. Video conferencing became mainstream with Skype in 2003. And Steve Jobs introduced the iPhone in 2007. These are trends of cell phone and smartphone use that demonstrate that more than 95% of Americans have a cell phone, and more than 75% have a smartphone. Furthermore, these numbers are similar across several demographic groups, including Blacks, Hispanics, and in people who make less than 30,000 a year. Despite the widespread access to technology, telemedicine expansion has been tempered due to two key issues, namely the lack of financial incentives and problems related to cybersecurity. In the next few slides, I want to use the following framework to examine these barriers by asking these questions. First, how did these barriers hinder telemedicine use prior to COVID-19? Second, how did the pandemic influence these barriers? And third, what are the limitations of current solutions? The first barrier to telemedicine expansion is the lack of financial incentives. As we examine these barriers, let's start with the first question. How did the lack of financial incentives hinder telemedicine use prior to COVID-19? Let's uh, look at the reimbursement policies from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Services before the pandemic. Pre-COVID-19, CMS had fairly restrictive policies regarding reimbursement for telemedicine. Services were only reimbursed in rural locations, provided the patient received services in a designated healthcare facility, meaning the patient was unable to receive services from home and the services covered were limited to a relatively small set of approved codes. In recent times, most notably in 2019, certain exceptions were made by CMS to cover care related to telestroke, substance use disorder, and end-stage renal disease, in addition to rural health. Further, Exceptions were also made for accountable care organizations participating in risk-based reimbursement models and Medicare Advantage plans if certain conditions were met. But overall, restrictions on what Medicare can pay continue to hinder the usage of telemedicine. Now let's move on to answering the second question, which is how did the pandemic influence financial incentives? On the 31st of January, 2020, the Secretary of Health and Human Services, Alex Azar, declared the coronavirus COVID-19 public health emergency under the Public Health Service Act. On March 13, 2020, the President declared a national emergency under the National Emergencies Act, providing access to federal relief money in addition to 136 statutory powers. In addition to this, a number of legislations were passed by Congress and subsequently by the Senate, which successively expanded telemedicine coverage and waived several existing requirements. There have been two more bills that have been passed on the 23rd of April and the 15th of May, not included on this slide. Of all of these different legislations, the CARES Act signals strong support for telemedicine and recognition from Congress that expanding access to virtual care is critical to defeating COVID-19. On the 31st of March, CMS announced sweeping new changes to Medicare in response to the pandemic. Notable updates include the coverage and reimbursement of over 80 telemedicine services for Medicare patients, including codes for critical care, 
emergency department visits and inpatient care. Further, coverage of certain services by telephone to both new and established patients was allowed. Remote patient monitoring was allowed for both new and established patients for both acute and chronic conditions. Examples include monitoring oxygen saturation levels using pulse oximetry. In addition, supervision requirements were changed. While the many changes from CMS certainly have expanded telemedicine access on the federal level, we need to take these into context with the overall landscape of health insurance regulation, which will help us answer the third question, what are the limitations of current policy updates? Coverage from Medicare roughly accounts for 15% of the American population. As you may recall from the earlier slides, around 50% of Americans have employer-dependent coverage. Further, around 21% of the population is covered by Medicaid. <clears throat> the states are the one that control both private payers, which provide employer-dependent coverage, and Medicaid. Therefore, pursuing telehealth policy changes at the state level appears to reach the greatest number of people because much of the power to regulate healthcare insurance has been designated to states. This patchwork of laws and regulations is exemplified by a set of rules that has been labeled as parity laws. So what is meant by parity laws? Essentially, these laws refer to the question, should telemedicine services be covered and reimbursed in the same way as in-person care? And there exists a wide range of interpretations across states. There are 13 states which have no private payer telemedicine parity laws. Of the states that do mandate some form of parity, seven states mandate partial coverage of telemedicine, specifying which services must be covered. 19 states mandate full coverage parity their coverage is the same for services delivered via telemedicine and in-person care. 11 states mandate full coverage and payment parity, wherein covered services must be reimbursed at the same rate as in-person visits. This has been the response from the states in response to the pandemic. So far, only 19 states have passed bills to address the problem of regulating parity laws to sustain the growth of telemedicine. Furthermore, states also need to develop a regulatory framework to allow for interstate services, licensure and credentialing of out-of-state providers. Therefore, to answer the final question in our framework for examining the role of financial incentives, what are the limitations of current solutions? The answer is current solutions are aimed for the short term, mainly working on the federal level, and states will need to play a more prominent role in addressing the issue of financial incentives and developing a regulatory framework for telemedicine. Moving on to the next barrier of cybersecurity. Let's go back to the same framework we used and start with the first question. How did cybersecurity hinder telemedicine use prior to COVID-19? In a 2019 PricewaterhouseCoopers survey of healthcare CEOs, an overwhelming majority pointed to concerns with ensuring cybersecurity and privacy as the top barrier for the adoption of digital strategies. Specifically with the adoption of telemedicine, these concerns stem from data protection and privacy regulations arising from the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, or HIPAA, of 1996, and the expansion of the penalties under the Health Information Technology for Economic Clinical Health, or the High Tech Act of 2009. Now let's take a look at HIPAA-compliant care delivery with telemedicine platforms that occurred prior to the pandemic. There are a number of commercial vendors <clears throat> that perform a variety of functions for assisting provider organizations for developing their telemedicine practice. They perform functions such as custom branding, 
implementation of standardized workflows, patient engagement, and integration with the EMR. Here at Yale Medicine, telemedicine visits have been performed with MyChart. Zoom and Epic entered into a partnership in 2018 that allowed for a HIPAA compliant integration of Zoom into MyChart. It is important to note that telemedicine functionality of MyChart is only available if health systems have paid access to this functionality of MyChart. This exposes a major drawback of proprietary telemedicine platforms, which is limited penetration due to increased expenses and requirement of a pre-existing robust health IT infrastructure. Now let's examine the second question in our framework. How did the pandemic influence problems related to cybersecurity? The Office of Civil Rights of the Department of Health and Human Services has issued a notification of enforcement discretion indicating it will not impose penalties for using HIPAA non-compliant private communication technologies to provide telehealth services during this public health emergency. To sustain the growth of telemedicine visits related to the pandemic, number of alternatives have come into use as a result of the enforcement discretion. Some of these include FaceTime, Zoom, WhatsApp, video, and proximity. However, many of these alternatives have major cybersecurity risks. Moving on to the third question in our framework, what are the limitations of current policy updates? Zoom, which has seen a phenomenal growth going from around 10 million users before the pandemic to over 200 million users in a short span of three months is a great example of the cybersecurity challenges that we face. Especially when used as a standalone application, Zoom has major problems, which is highlighted by the rise of Zoom bombing currently being investigated by the FBI. In addition to cybersecurity, the current technology does not definitively address the issues related to using telemedicine platforms to overcome language barriers, compatibility problems, and taking care of underserved populations. So far, we have explored two key barriers to telemedicine expansion financial incentives and cybersecurity. With the policy updates resulting from the pandemic, the effects of these barriers have attenuated, led to a tremendous uptake of telemedicine across the country. Here are some of the news headlines that capture the influence of the pandemic. An unexpected benefit of the pandemic, telehealth visits explored in COVID-19 may permanently alter the telehealth landscape. As thousands, as a result of thousands of televisits done during the pandemic, there has been an accumulation of a wealth of knowledge on developing durable programs. Here is a sample framework which demonstrates the requirement of a multidisciplinary council with representatives from clinical leadership, coding, regulatory, IT support for EMR integration and developing training capacity for, pro for providers and ancillary staff. Further, several best practices have been shared from this collective experience to operationalize telemedicine. The most important of these is creating a workflow that is analogous to in-person visits using appointment reminders, virtual front desk staff, and performing test visits in advance, allowing for troubleshooting. All of these which assist with successful implementation. While these short-term gains have brought telemedicine and virtual care to the forefront of care delivery, there remain additional issues which have not been addressed during the reactionary phase of our response to the pandemic. To allow for the durable adoption of telemedicine, and sustain the progress made it will be crucial to examine these challenges in detail. Further, these challenges represent opportunities for innovation. These are the issues, physical examination and 
quality and outcomes that I will explore in the next section of my talk. The physical examinations remains a critical component of the evaluation of a patient. I want to introduce two models of telemedicine that have found workarounds for the requirement of physical exam. These are models which existed before the pandemic, which have been well validated and deployed across the country in acute care settings. EICU or tele-ICU and tele-stroke. Since much of medical decision-making is cognitive, these models provide rapid access to specialist care by outsourcing the physical exam to the bedside clinician for obtaining actionable information. But what happens when the physical exam cannot be outsourced to a clinician? Performing the equivalent of a complete clinical exam by telemedicine would be unusual. The following approaches have been described for obtaining focused information. There have been anecdotes of the diagnosis of surgical emergencies such as peritonitis with the help of a directed caregiver exam. However, the greatest potential for obtaining actionable information during a telemedicine visit is in the integration of technology to assist clinical examination. And here I want to share three examples. The first one, this is a device called TitoCare. It is a small square device that is three inches on each side, two inches deep, and sits with a satisfying weight in the palm of your hand. It has a small LED screen on the front and a camera and a thermometer on the back. There are several adapters that extend its functionality to conducting directed ear and throat exams and auscultation. This device is currently available at Best Buy and there are a number of pilots that are currently evaluating its use during the pandemic. The second example is a class of devices that falls under the umbrella term of remote monitoring. In the top two panels, we have the Alive Core monitor and the Apple Watch, which have the functionality of monitoring heart rhythm. The bottom two panels are implantable devices. Uh, the CardioMEMS device, which performs real-time monitoring of pulmonary artery pressures, and the very familiar ICD on the left side, which performs a host of monitoring functions. These class of devices have seen a remarkable growth, and many are being actively studied for applications within cardiovascular medicine. The third example is of the next generation of remote monitoring technology, which has been labeled as contactless monitoring. This particular example highlights a technology developed by researchers at MIT who have developed a system that works by sending radio signals that will bounce off a person and back to the device. These signals travel through walls just as wireless internet signals do, and are able to create a map of humans. This system is being tested during the pandemic to monitor a patient's breathing, movement, and sleep patterns. Moving on to the next challenge, quality and outcomes. Here I'm starting off with a cautionary tale. This is the Tele-HF study published in 2010. More than 1,500 patients recently admitted for heart failure were randomized to a telephone-based interactive voice response system versus usual care. The primary endpoint was all-cause readmissions and mortality within 180 days. This turned out to be a negative study. There was no statistical difference in readmissions for any reason, which occurred with 49% uh, uh, of patients in the telemonitoring group and 47% of patients in the usual care group. Similarly, there was no difference in mortality, which occurred in 11.1% of the telemonitoring group and 11.4% of the usual care group. The patients enrolled in this study were from 2006 through 2009, which was a different time in terms of the availability of smartphone technology. However, the results indicate the importance of a thorough independent evaluation of disease management strategies before their adoption. And this conclusion made by the authors 
is extremely relevant in today's world. I want to share two examples of innovations that highlight the importance of these conclusions. The first example is chatbots. This particular chatbot has been developed by a startup based out of San Francisco named Uper AI. Their chatbot is able to elicit specific information from its users related to their emotions. And based on the responses, it provides interventions based on cognitive behavioral therapy. Similarly, here's another chatbot developed to assess the risk of COVID-19. Developed by Bree Labs, based out of Massachusetts, and officially endorsed by the state of Massachusetts. There have been a number of chatbots developed for the pandemic, and the rapid uptake of the technology has exposed its flaws. I asked eight chatbots whether I had COVID-19. The answers ranged from low risk to start home isolation. These are the kind of problems that will be seen by the adoption of new technology without conducting thorough evaluation. Moving on to our next example, the virtual hospital. This is a startup in Boston called Medically Home, which is working on developing the virtual hospital model based in the patient's home for select diagnosis that, require, that traditionally require hospitalization. Their model involves deploying remote monitoring solutions at home for conducting 24 seven care monitoring and developing a mission control center for advancing clinical care. A similar concept has also been tested at Mount Sinai with the help of an innovation grant from the Center for Medicare and Medicaid Innovation Institute. These are the results of a pilot study. This was a case control study conducted at Mount Sinai with 507 patients, which found that compared with patients receiving inpatient care, uh, outcomes from patients enrolled in a hospital at home care program, showing a shorter length of stay and uh, improved outcomes at 30 days, including readmissions, emergency department visits. There was no difference in the rates of adverse events. It is innovative care delivery models such as these, which underscore the point that telemedicine growth is less about technology and more about developing efficient workflows. In summary, we have explored the role of innovation for addressing the following challenges, physical examination and quality and outcomes for telemedicine growth. These certainly do not encompass all the different challenges for telemedicine growth. We will need to figure out innovative ways to take on more complex issues, such as applying telemedicine for eliminating health disparities and studying the risk of fraud with digital services. As telemedicine has become the predominant means of care delivery during the pandemic, how will these changes affect the experience of being a physician the experience of being a patient. To answer these questions, I want to examine two trends that existed prior to the pandemic. The first one is the rise of the virtualist, and the second one is the consumerization of healthcare. There is a viewpoint published before the pandemic that argued for the development of an entirely new medical specialty labeled as the virtualist. It was proposed that medical virtualists could be involved in a substantial proportion of healthcare delivery for the next generation. Virtualists will be physicians who will spend the majority or all of their time caring for patients using a virtual medium. And as we can see, as a result of the pandemic, most clinicians have been turned into a full-time virtualist almost overnight. As a result of physicians spending a majority or all of their time caring for patients using a virtual medium, there are a new set of problems that arise. The first is we will need professional consensus on a set of core competencies for the delivery of virtual care. Second, we will need formal training in techniques in achieving good website manner. 
Third, we will need a set of guidelines for graduate medical education for facilitating the training of the next generation of physicians in the delivery of virtual care. There is another appeal for physicians in becoming virtualists. This is a snapshot from a telemedicine startup called Veal based out of Austin, Texas that specializes in recruiting clinicians. Their motto is happier clinicians make healthier patients. And they also claim your schedule is about to be yours again. I'm not sure how much of this is actually true, but it certainly makes for an attractive marketing tactic. While the rise of virtual medicine is changing, what it means to be a physician, the trend of consumerization of healthcare is redefining the patient experience. Even before the pandemic, the utility of in-person care has been questioned. Here is a perspective piece before the pandemic, which argued for in-person care as option B. The demotion of in-person care to option B certainly seems apt if a patient has to go through the following. The patient experience for a 15 minute appointment starts with finding time off work. Some patients need to find childcare. Others may need to arrange transportation. If one is driving, they need to find parking. If the appointment is in a large academic health center, then it is hard to not get lost. If one finds the office on time, there is waiting room anxiety. And sometimes patients are asked to undress into a thin gown while waiting for their doctor. The economic forces driving the consumerization of healthcare have led to the rise of retail clinics and subscription-based care. Here is an example. One Medical is a primary care startup with offices located in large cities. They provide membership-based primary care targeting high income earners with private insurance. Patients have the option of same day appointments in office or remote to 24 seven video chat with providers. Further, the care experience is described as being faster, easier, and more enjoyable. Currently membership based primary care may be limited to a niche population of high income earners. However, I cannot help but wonder if the future, if this portends a future wherein primary care is seen as a service that is subscribed to alongside entertainment and fitness related services. In summary, we have examined these two trends the rise of the virtualist and the consumerization of healthcare. And finally, moving towards the conclusion of my talk. There are several unanswered questions with the pandemic. When will the pandemic end? How will it end? And what will happen afterward? One thing is certain that telemedicine has proven to be a helpful ally in the fight against the pandemic. And the time to prepare for the future is now. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sameet, um, for that very, um, you know, comprehensive uh, look at the current situation now and, you know, kind of some of the innovations um, in telehealth as we prepare for the future. Um, as a compliment, um, I think, to this excellent um, overview that you've given, I thought it was, well, we thought it was important to uh, bring in uh, more of our own experience, uh, the Yale cardiovascular experience uh, with telehealth. And uh, I've asked Joyce and Erica to very kindly uh, sort of weigh in as they have been at some of the forefront of uh, the telehealth experience here at Yale. And also as we look forward to the reopening and getting things back online, what will things look like um, in the future. So thank you again so much. And uh, Joyce, the floor is yours. Thank you. Uh, can you all hear me? I think, I hope you can hear me. Yes, we can okay. hear you. <laughs> Good. Um, excellent. Let me just get that back up there. 
Okay, perfect. Yes, thank you so much, Sumit, for that excellent um, overview of telemedicine in general, before and after the pandemic. You um, really basically encompassed everything into 40 minutes. It was quite impressive. Um, <clears throat> so basically, I want, um, Eric and I wanted to bring into the whole uh, telemedicine at Yale. And so prior to COVID-19, um, this was the uh, te Yale telehealth slide um, that showed all of the aspects of telemedicine that was provided by Yale. Um, and the biggest thing um, is that the tele-ICU and the, and the tele-neurology and the tele-stroke were the biggest things that Yale, you know, really did. We had some e-consults going um, through neurology uh, and cardiology mainly. Um, and then the, there was um, some start of the CHF pilot in terms of care management, um, as well as care management for other non-heart failure um, diagnoses. We didn't have a lot of video visits. There were some post-surgical visits that they were doing, but not very many at all. And unfortunately, um, although these have all been in place for years, it, it never really, telemedicine never really took off. There was a lot of resistance from um, the administration, from providers, from uh, you know, the financial aspect of it all. And mostly that stems from the fact that CMS wasn't paying for a lot of it. <clears throat> so obviously, as we heard, uh, the pandemic changed all of that. And so on the inpatient side, they already had the tele-ICU, um, but we were able to increase the number of in-touch health video cameras to 600 across the Yale New Haven health system in both the ICU and non-ICU COVID patient rooms. The idea was to decrease the number of times that the nurse had to go into, uh, into and out of the patient's room and thus conserve PPE. When we ran out of the in-touch health uh, cameras, uh, the next step was to add Amazon uh, Echo shows to the ER rooms and the uh, COVID floors. So they, uh, they actually deployed approximately 200 Echo shows to do a similar thing as the in-touch health, um, which was to be able to have providers and nurses speak with the patients in the room over a video uh, platform without having to go into the room. In addition, the inpatient e-consults took form. Um, it, prior to that, Erica and Bob McNamara had been doing the cardiology e-consults as an outpatient, but now it became um, something we could use inpatient um, where there was provider to provider recommendations after uh, a chart review um, and the hospitalist or nocturnalist who is in the hospital could then just follow the recommendations um, of the e-consultant. And then another thing that happened during this uh, pandemic inpatient was the start of some um, devices to help with telemetry. Obviously, we uh, ran out of telemetry beds. I don't know if everybody knew that um, across the system, and we needed other ways. And so um, we were using the MCT Preventus monitors for the non-COVID patients on floors that didn't have any telemetry units, uh, any telemetry boxes but they did require telemetry. And then for the COVID patients who were going home on medications that could cause QT prolongation, um, the MediLinks um, MCT devices were actually used um, as well. So that was all in the inpatient setting that basically happened over the span of two months. From an ambulatory standpoint, um, Basically, we uh, started doing a lot of video visits, telephone visits. We also um, have a SNF telehealth visit, and we saw an increase in the outpatient e-consults. So this graph here uh, with the light teal color basically shows the number of video visits from the beginning of March, which was 13, to, um, to the basically middle of May, which shows that there are now 4,216 uh, video visits over the course of, or over the span of the health system. Telephone encounters also increased from four to 3,108. 
the jagged lines is just because of the fact that weekends were there in the middle. So it's, it's pretend you don't see the dips. Um, and overall, the in-person encounters went from, from 31,598 down to 17,347. Um, so the ambulatory telemedicine at Yale basically exploded over two weeks in March. So on March 13th, uh, the Department of Internal Medicine um, telemedicine uh, committee was formed. By March 14th, we had sent out messages to all the providers to download Haiku Kanto and basically start to decrease the number of in-person patients seen in the ambulatory setting. By March 15th, we had a, our first cheat sheet for telemedicine sent out so that everyone kind of knew the whole uh, flow of the telephone visit versus the video visit. And by March 20th, just a week later, instead of recommending to postpone the patients in person, the recommendation was to convert most of the visits to telemedicine rather than postpone the visits. And um, you can see our MyChart video visits um, in March, obviously we we're talking about mid-March, went from 15% of our visits to 40% of our visits by mid-May. Uh, and you can see our numbers of telehealth in March versus in-person visits. We had about 40% of telehealth visits, um, whereas now, mid-May mid now, uh, our number of telehealth visits are up to 1956 visits, but remember, we're only about halfway through May. Um, in-person dropped dramatically, uh, dramatically down to 231, and our percent of telehealth increased up to 89%. And this literally was in the span of two, two and a half months. So I guess when we can have an incentive to do it, you know, tele telemedicine, we, we could actually push it out. Um, in addition, there was a lot of virtual learning. There were a lot of meetings um, using Zoom and Skype. Um, we have cardiology grand rounds, internal medicine grand rounds, subspecialty teaching sessions, and even outside of Yale uh, CME opportunities, all with um, these platforms. Um, just so you know, though, we've had a lot of telemedicine at Yale Cardiology and the Heart and Vascular Center even prior to um, the COVID pandemic. Obviously, my chart is a platform that patients can email with their uh, providers and get um, some medical advice without having to go into the office. Um, the AICD monitoring basically is using um, a platform called 91 Life, where all of the different um, daily summaries or weekly summaries from all of the different vendors pull into 91 Life, which then will go into Epic. Heart failure outpatient monitoring um, is about to start with a, a program called Vivify, where they're able to, to get patients' devices so that they'll be able to see their vital signs of the patients while the patients are home. We continue to use event monitors and halters with Preventus, Biotel, and Medilinks. We have the link indwelling monitors, the cardio MEMS for pulmonary artery pressures, cardio server for EKGs, where providers can read EKGs even from their iPhone if they wanted to. And I've had a couple of patients who have Apple Watches who send me their EKGs through my chart. Um, so we are doing a lot of telemedicine, even though you might not have thought about it. Um, future things uh, that have been in discussion are to get those blood pressure, pulse oximeters, and scales um, mm -hmm. to patients and having them actually, all their vital signs go directly into their EPIC chart. Um, that's something that IT has been working on. And uh, we heard from Su Sumit about the um, stethoscopes and other devices that we'll be able to kind of hear heart sounds um, while we're home and the patient is at their home as well. So that is our quick summary of Yale and telemedicine. Uh, Joyce, thank you so very much um, for that very excellent summary. Erica, I'm going to ask you to uh, weigh in uh, with any additional thoughts. Sure. Um, Sameet, that was an excellent talk and I think really highlighted um, the history and uh, really complex forces that, uh, that contribute to uh, launching telehealth in a way that is safe, 
and effective and that enhances the user experience. Um, I guess I wanted to underscore a few points that Samit brought up um, because it resonates with our history. Um, one is really working with the state around uh, regulations as well as reimbursement. I mean, we think about reimbursement for patients with Medicaid, but also really the regulatory environment in which telehealth is taking place. And those need to be aligned. Um, I can say that I think going back to about 2012, I've been going up to the state with uh, Dr. Sue, Sue Lagarde, who's the executive director of Fairhaven, um, meeting with the health, uh, meeting with the state to uh, advance telemedicine. And there really needs to be, you know, a visionary outlook for where telemedicine will go. And then once we have buy-in, then we can really build the regulatory policies around it many of which are rapidly evolving even within the last two years and then of course within the last few months. So um, O'Yuri, you had asked over a chat, you know, what does it look like going forward? I think we need to, this really requires a very, very multidisciplinary team that includes not just clinicians and analysts and IT, but also experts in billing and regulation. Mm -hmm and our advocates that go to the state from the health system to advocate for um, policies that protect us as clinicians and as well as our patients. And I'd also like to say that, you know, um, we also know that so much of its effectiveness is in the implementation stage. So as Sunit was saying, you know, technology alone won't bring us quality. Uh, we really need to work with um, healthcare designers to optimize the patient experience, to optimize our experience, to really think about effective designs and workflows that um, we can uh, then use to enhance the intervention and study its outcomes. Um, we've done a number of different trials, as Sumit was saying. Um, uh, Dr. Chowdhury of Internal Medicine led the telehealth um, heart failure study over a decade ago. Uh, we recently did a large study using um, text messaging with um, in secondary disease prevention in China. And it's humbling work and you recognize that it's really iterative work and you really need to kind of hammer home on the implementation of these technologies, I think, to, to get the outcomes that we desire. So moving forward, I think this is an exciting time because there's much more buy-in uh, to the value of um, telemedicine. There's much more of a business case to do telemedicine as well as um, reimbursement increases. But I think we still have a lot of work to do to um, really get the value from this that we want in terms of um, patient outcomes. So yeah, yeah, I agree, Erica. Space. And so in answer to your question, Oyeri, the, the a thought process from Yale Medicine is that at least 20 to 30 percent of our ambulatory uh, visits will remain telemedicine of some sort, preferably the video visit. But that does bring up a, a lot of questions, um, as we see in the chat room, is what is the liability? Um, and so, as Erica had said, we really need to, you know, discuss this in a multidisciplinary manner to just have make sure that everyone from our institution standpoint, you know, understands that, you know, after the pandemic is over, right now we're all quote unquote covered in terms of liability from um, the CARES Act and and so we can, you know, we can't be held in case we missed something on a physical exam that we didn't do because of a telephone visit or a video visit. But how is that gonna look in the future? And we really need to have very clear guidelines um, from the state and the federal level, I think, as well as agreements with the insurance companies um, for what will continue to be paid for. And, and, and are they going to put restrictions again on or in the next couple of months as to who, do, who is able to get a video visit, who is able to get a telephone visit? And um, as we've seen in the last two months with the rapid change over telemedicine and reimbursement and what can and cannot happen, um, as things get more regulated, we'll hopefully be able to have a little bit more of a voice because now as providers, we see some benefits to having some telehealth. Um, I see Sarah has yeah. her, her hand. I raised. did also just want to add one thing about the legal, the liability question, and it does go to 
you know, not kind of going off on your own to do this because I know we're all capable and we feel like we, you know, offer a really, and you can do some of that, you know, but really in a more systematic way, it is good to have, you really need to have the system behind you. Our experience with e-consults, I mean, we worked extensively with our Yale legal team and we have very specific language in there that is protective and that was informed mm -hmm. by primary care and specialty care and legal and a very big deep dive into laws and lawsuits and such. So for example, I know e-consults feels like, oh, I do them all the time. Isn't this an e-consult? Can I bill as an e-consult? You know, the actual care is probably not any different, but the environment in which you do it and the, you know, the legal parameters around that are real and preferably, you know, come to Joyce or to me and we can help with, you know, figuring that out because it is something that we'll want to ve pay very close attention to and that can be worked out. And there's a larger team um, that's yeah. really looking into those things. So Sarah is raising her hand. Sarah Hull. Oh, thank you so much. I'm, I'm glad to see that that worked. Um, <laughs> thank, thank you everyone for, um, Sumit, that was an incredible talk and Joyce and Erica, thank you so much for that, that supplemental data. Um, you know, I, I obviously like there's as you know, I'm not going to over restate what everyone else stated that there's a huge potential for growth and expansion of services. But um, I, I am a little bit concerned about just talking some of the argue. There were a lot of positive arguments made, particularly um, with respect to um, telehealth as sort of a natural uh, branching out of the the, cons the commodification or the consumerization of medicine. And I, I would just say, you know, from a normative standpoint, that that's problematic. Um, I, I think it's it's problematic just from a categorical standpoint that healthcare is not like entertainment. Um, if you don't have access to the latest gadgets and streaming services, like you're gonna be okay. But if you if you have suboptimal access to healthcare, you're you're not going to be okay. And and we've seen that. We, that's actually unfolded during this pandemic quite starkly that we that we see that the social determinants of health have really impacted wh what populations are being most adversely affected by by the coronavirus. So um, even though it's it's sexy to talk about all these new tools and you know great access, which is important, we, I, I think we also have to bear in mind that we need to include everybody in our telehealth initiatives, and that I would urge us not to view patients as consumers and not to view mm -hmm. ourselves as providers. You know, we're not we're not glorified salespeople. We are we are physicians. We are experts in cardiovascular disease. What what we quote provide is not something that's subject to the normal supply demand economics. That it's a very inelastic demand. And you know, wh whether or not you agree that healthcare is a right, um, I, I certainly rather than you know something that is is a privilege or people should buy access to. I, I have my own feelings on that, but I I think we can all agree that that the the the, the in, intense disparities that exist um, because mm -hmm. of social determinants of health. We, we need to make sure that as we're developing telehealth platforms, that we're being very intentional to use that to mitigate some of these disparities rather than unintentionally exacerbating them. And, and that's a great fear I have. And I think we need to be very intentional and mindful in, in how we roll these things out because all mm -hmm. of these awesome gadgets that we have probably the patients who struggle the most to come to the office to see us, they probably are not the patients who have the coolest gadgets either. So yeah. thank you. Thanks, Sarah. Um, Eric Velasquez, I see your hand raised. Yeah, so first of all, Sumit, um, a phenomenal job. Congratulations for summarizing a challenging um, topic uh, that's very pertinent in a very uh, uh, user-friendly uh, uh, way. Um, uh, uh, we're very proud of, of, you, of you and your talk. Um, I, I have, um, first of all, I wanted to highlight Sarah's recent comment. I think that's a very critical issue that we have to, uh, to address as we continue to roll out um, these opportunities for te telehealth, which is to, uh, to understand the impact, particularly on our most vulnerable uh, populations that we serve, and uh, not to uh, use this as an excuse to, uh, to uh, Break down the, the very special um, barriers and relationships, uh, very special relationships that we have um, a, 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 with our, our patients, and I think that's um, 
that it, it, she said it beautifully uh, um, that we're not just providers. Um, and so um, one thing that has, um, that I guess I wanted to ask Samit about um, uh, is we're going to need very, uh, uh, maybe novel approaches to evaluating um, these devices or strategies as they evolve. And they're going to be evolving very rapidly. And so uh, just like we have moved perhaps towards adaptive designs um, uh, in our clinical trials of new therapeutics for coronavirus uh, um, as one strategy, or have you thought about what kind of um, uh, approaches we should be uh, developing or putting in place to evaluate these uh, these new technologies as they come online, so that we can get some uh, 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 we can understand their impact before uh, uh, before there's any harm. Yeah. So uh, thanks, uh, Dr. Velasquez. And uh, first, I wanted to respond to Sarah's point. So you know, um, I started my talk by mentioning how disparities are being worsened by pandemic and I'm no in uh, no way endorsing the consumerization of healthcare. But the reason for including in the talk is to understand uh, the kind of pathway where some of the innovation has been taking place and to learn from it to develop newer models of care delivery. And I absolutely agree that there's, <clears throat> you know, a huge set of populations, as I pointed out earlier, the people in the lowest income quartiles that are being affected the worst. And uh, we will need newer approaches, you know, newer uh, reimbursement models for Medicaid patients, uh, newer ways to introduce technology for the underserved population to uh, bring them into the fold of uh, healthcare. Um, as to your question of uh, testing these technologies, so in terms, you know, from, um, for startups, the problem is that they have a very rapid cycle of uh, raising money and then testing their product and then raising money, it goes on. And the problem is with the current research um, methodology, these, many of these startups are not able to invest as much time and capital uh, because of the, um, you know, because conducting trials and uh, is very expensive. So I think, ways where um, you know academic centers such as Yale can work with these um, innovative startups and figure out ways to conduct low cost uh, investigative studies would be the way to uh, generate more evidence to test these technologies. Great. Um, thank you so very much, uh, Samit, and also a big thanks to uh, Joyce and also to Erica uh, for chiming in. I think, again, this is an excellent talk and, you know, very timely discussion as we try to figure out, um, you know, the way forward uh, from here. So thanks again to everyone for joining. Uh, please uh, join us again uh, next week, same time, same place, um, for Grand Rounds. Um, I believe uh, Dr. Ken Ellenbogen is giving grand rounds um, next week. Uh, we'll send the details out of that. Uh, so thanks again, everyone, and uh, have a good day. Thank you. Thank you.